<laughs> All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and tonight is going to be, um, well, let me start with the theme of tonight. So the theme for tonight's Dharma Doors is miracles, parentheses, purifying Buddha lands. <laughs> so we kind of have, it's not two themes. We're going to talk about miracles <clears throat> and we're going to be talking about purifying Buddha lands as a concept or as an idea, as part of this kind of ongoing series of the Bodhisattva path or the way of the Bodhisattva. And so tonight's theme is about miracles within the Buddhist tradition as it pertains to this process of purifying Buddha lands. So that's what we're going to talk about. And what we're going to read is part four, uh, or this is part four of our study of the Manjushri Pure Land Sutra. I mentioned this a few times, you know, that the sutra that we're kind of referencing for this series is the sutra about the Bodhisattva Manjushri's Pure Land. So <laughs> the idea is we're going to learn tonight about this idea of purifying Buddha lands, which is kind of the theme of the sutra in that way. Um, so in order to start, I just want to kind of mention quickly about last week. So last week's theme, it was about faith or devotion within Buddhism, but also sort of we were dealing with ideas of the supernatural because there were a lot of different heavenly beings and nagas and yakshas and all kinds of other beings going on in this sutra. And I just wanted to make it clear, like what kind of that was all about in a way to relate with that. And so all of this, all of the, the, um, the fanfare <clears throat> going on last week about the Buddha and praising the Buddha and getting excited about the Buddha, the idea was the Buddha was coming to town. And tonight the Buddha is going to arrive in Rajgriha. But in order, before we get there, I want to mention a miracle that already happened last time. There were a series actually of miracles that happened, but there was one that I said, of, I actually mentioned it a few times, but I didn't really elaborate on it. So I think it's a great place to start. So the miracle that I'm referring to is the miracle that when the Buddha was headed to town, he took these seven steps and everywhere he stepped, a giant lotus flower the size of a wagon wheel, a jeweled lotus flower the size of a wagon wheel sprung up with a bodhisattva on it. And then these lotus flowers circled the city of Rajgriha, reciting praises of the Buddha. And that's a poem that I read last time. So we focused on all of that as a kind of supernatural event and also sort of about the idea of praising the Buddha and what that might mean. But what I didn't mention was this idea of the seven steps and the lotus flowers. So this is a reference, or as far as, far as I can tell, this is a reference to a classic part of the story of Siddhartha, right, which is kind of the life story of the Buddha. And in the traditional telling of the life story of the Buddha, when the Buddha was first born, when Siddhartha was first born, he leapt out of his mother's side and took seven steps. And each step the baby took, a little lotus flower would pop up so that he wouldn't touch the ground. He was walking on lotus flowers. And then at the end of these seven steps, he, the tradition is he made a posture pointing one hand up and one hand down. And you might see little statues of a baby Buddha doing a kind of disco move, one hand up, one hand down. But that depiction is the infant, the, the just born baby Buddha, having taken these seven lotus steps, declaring 
this is my final rebirth. I'm done. This is it. And that's the lion's roar, this announcement that you're done with the rebirth cycle. Wow, he made the lion's roar like the day he was born. Wow. So that's sort of kind of maybe a reference to the steps with the lotus flowers. But now we're in this Mahayana world where it's the fully the adult Buddha who is just taking a walk, <laughs> going to town. And these giant lotus flowers appear with bodhisattvas and they're flying around. And so we see that the, the mythology or the, the, the use of these symbols has grown as we get into this. So that's where we're at in the story. The Buddha is about to arrive at town and these bodhisattvas have just recited a, uh, a poem. That's pretty much my intro. I'm going to read the first uh, kind of couple paragraphs here and then have a little bit to say. So then the city of Rajgriha's many citizens were so inspired by these bodhisattva's verses that all the men and women and boys and girls preferred flowers, incense, garlands, ointments, powders, and the scented powders of golden and silver flowers. They hoisted parasols, banners, and flags, and they took up large drums, conches, bamboo vinyas, and tambourines. Bearing all of this, they thought about the Tathagata, the thus come one, and held the thus come one in mind. With their minds dwelling on the Buddha, they were happy and joyful as they stood waiting. All right, so everybody has come out to see the Buddha arrive. They've brought offerings of all kinds, right? Um, and they await his arrival. So then the world honored one, the blessed one, the Bhagavan, arrived in the city of Rajgriha. And the moment his right foot touched its threshold, the entire city shook six times. Hundreds of thousands of divine and human instruments played without being struck and a rain of divine flowers fell. The blind could see, the deaf could hear, the insane regained their senses, the inattentive became concentrated, the naked received clothes, the hungry received food, and the poor obtained wealth. At that moment, no one was tormented by Greed, anger, or delusion, jealousy, stinginess, rage, or pride. And at that moment, everyone was filled with metta and karuna, love and compassion, and they regarded one another as parents. It was like this. <laughs> and they're about to recite a poem. But before we hear the citizens of Rajgriha recite this poem, I want to take a step back to talk a little bit about these miracles. So, you know, one in, one in particular that just comes to mind, jumps off the page, is the miracle that the blind could see. <laughs> that sounds familiar. I feel like I've heard that miracle somewhere else before. <laughs> Some of these actually sound familiar to other spiritual traditions where the revered teachers, the revered leaders cause the blind to see, cause the deaf to hear, cause the insane to be sane. Um, this is sort of, again, it's, these are themes that we hear in other spiritual traditions, religious or otherwise. So I kind of want to talk a little bit about what's going on with that. So there's so much talk about such events as this. I leave it entirely open to possibility, of course, that, the, that at the time of the Buddha, 
or something to that effect. When the Buddha rolled into town, the blind could see and the deaf could hear. I, you know, I don't know. I leave it entirely open to possibility, just like with all these other uh, stories or teachings about spiritual masters having the same effect. So I just want to put that out there, that I leave it entirely open to possibility that this, that this is kind of literal in a way. Why not? But let's take a step back. What I want to talk about is not so much the specific miracles, um, although I do want to mention a couple of ideas about the blind seeing and the deaf hearing and all of that. But just to focus on tonight's theme, what sort of is that's being described there, especially sort of this, um, the what was the line about the, the naked receiving clothes and the hungry receiving food? So what's kind of being implied there in that statement, or actually in that paragraph, something that's being described is what is often called the Buddha's sphere of influence. And it's a part of the Buddhist tradition, and it's definitely a part of the Mahayana Buddhist tradition, that a fully enlightened being, a Buddha, a Buddha, has this sort of sphere, <laughs> going up, going to the sides, going down below, a sphere of influence. And that actually just being in that sphere of influence can cause miracles, can cause the blind to see, can cause the deaf to hear, can cause the naked to gain clothing. So that sphere of influence, that idea is a part of Buddhism. Check, exactly. So we're, we're, we're going to get there. So the idea is, is that this sphere of influence, it, it's a part of Buddhism sort of from the beginning, and it comes to be kind of called or known as a Buddha Kshetra, a Buddha field. And the way it's described, it's like, it's kind of like a magnetic field. You know, if you have kind of, you know, two magnets, they get close enough together and they'll stick, right? But if they're far enough apart, the you won't feel the influence. Well, Buddha is like a magnet that way. And if, if you get close enough, <laughs> things can kind of happen in that way. And so that sphere of influence is this Buddha Kshetra, which is a field, a Buddha field. And then that idea of a Buddha field or a Buddha Kshetra becomes known as or becomes referred to as a Buddha land, meaning like that, that zone, that sphere of influence is now called a, called a Buddha land. And that is an extension of the idea of a Buddha field or a Buddha Kshetra. So that's sort of the introduction of this idea of a, at least a kind of a brief little quick genealogy, if you will, of the idea of a Buddha land. But now let's like kind of go a little bit deeper because there was a note in the chat, I think, was that Jenny? Yeah. Jenny, you had the great comment, right? About seeing the Dharma and hearing the Dharma. Wait, that, that wasn't me though. Oh, the other Jenny. That was the other, other Jenny. Jenny. Other Jenny. Other Jenny. Great, <laughs> great observation. So there is a kind of poetic way, a more poetic way, which is kind of what Jenny's comment alluded to, a kind of more poetic way to understand this idea of the blind being able to see. And I was trying to find the exact quote, the exact line. I was reading a sutra the other day, and it was also in verse, and it had a beautiful line. And, you know, there's the Buddha or Buddhas, of which there are many, are often described as illuminators, great lamps of the world, they are sometimes called. And I was reading one of these poems and it was describing the Buddha as a great illuminator, like a great lamp of the world that allows sentient beings to see the error of their ways. And I thought that was a beautiful line of describing what I've described in other Dharma doors talks, which is these other ways of seeing 
And that, yes, we see with our eyes, but we also see with our mind. We talk about our mind's eye. And when we you know, imagine things or think about things, we think about that way of seeing. And I have sort of described the idea of coming to certain realizations about say suffering and what causes suffering and the way that if you come to an understanding oh craving as in a cause of suffering to see that and to come to see that by learning the dharma the dharma is functioning as a lamp as a light that is allowing you to see the kind of the light of wisdom so I do think there's a way to read the sphere of influence, to read the sutra, to read that the blind could see in kind of many ways, many levels in that sense. Also with the, the deaf being able to hear, also Jenny's comment about the Dharma, hearing the Dharma, exactly. These teachings, these ideas, they're out there all the time, but who has the ears to hear it, right? That's the idea. Um, and then, also extrapolating or kind of extending the idea of that sphere of influence in which the naked receive clothes and the hungry receive food. Well, the Buddha, of course, has in, in his life and then within the larger structure of the religion is constantly encouraging people to be generous, <laughs> is constantly encouraging people to practice dana and charity and, and give. And so there's this idea that within the sphere of influence of a Buddha Daha, there's a lot of generosity going on. <laughs> he, he kind of gets people to be generous and therefore kind of wherever he goes, there's a lot of generosity going on. And the naked receive clothing and the food and then and the hungry receive food. So, and so on and so forth, until we get to the end where, and at that moment, no one was tormented by the three poisons, greed, anger, and delusion, nor jealousy, stinginess, rage, or pride. And that's really, I would say, kind of that sphere of influence of the Buddha or Buddhism in that way, that within that sphere of influence of the Dharma, those are the things that are being overcome by those practicing the dharma and so what i'm kind of wanting to start getting at even before we read the poem is that there's this way of describing the and i kind of it's, it's interesting i didn't even really realize i was doing that but there's a way of describing sort of the the life of the buddha the life of siddhartha from the birth from the seven steps, from the declaration, to the life as a prince, to being married, to having a child, to relinquishing the home life, going off to the homeless life. That process within the Mahayana tradition becomes, I've, I've mentioned, I think in one of the earlier parts of this series, it becomes a kind of archetypal journey that Anybody who has sort of decided to end suffering, <laughs> you are now on the Bodhisattva path. And if you want to know what the Bodhisattva path is like, you can kind of look to the life story of Siddhartha sort of for these clues. And so what I mean is, is that within the, even the earliest Hinayana, the earliest tradition, when we were only talking about Sid Siddhartha, only talking about that one historical personage, that one historical Buddha, there was this idea that when Siddhartha was born and was the Bodhisattva, the, 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 the being of enlightenment that would become the Buddha, that that lifetime, and in some traditions, this is actually even way before he was born as Siddhartha. But that lifetime of practice leading up to sitting under the Bodhi tree and attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, Supreme Unsurpassable Enlightenment, that that process of a life lived of practice is referred to as 
the purification of the Buddha land, <laughs> that that's what was going on during that time is that the Bodhisattva, in this case, Siddhartha, was purifying the Buddha land or just purifying the land until that point of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi in which the land had been purified, a pure Buddha land, as it would be called. So that's sort of an introduction to kind of this idea of purifying Buddha lands. And actually, actually I realize this is a little premature, <laughs> but that's okay because we're planting seeds for the future. So on that note, we're gonna move back to the, the sutra. Um, so after everybody is elated and excited now that the Buddha is here and, um, oh, actually one, one last line that I really want to address. It's the very last part of it. So at that moment, everyone there was filled with metta and the karuna, right? Loving kindness and compassion. And they regarded one another as parents. And that line, actually, when you, you know, I've told everybody we're also, we have the aversion from the Chinese. I'm reading an English translation from the Tibetan, but there is an English translation from the Chinese and it's helpful to go back and forth. And it's an interesting line. And if you read the Chinese, it actually has more to do with kind of more uh, not just tr tr like treating each other like we're all like parents at the PTA conference or something like we're all parents it's not quite what it means and if you read the Chinese you understand that it's more about familiar relationships in, in many ways just a general sentiment of treating everyone as a family member in that way but I want to take a minute to talk about that line because it's kind of a beautiful sentiment. It really speaks to a lot of, it actually speaks a lot to what the, the great vehicle is, what the Mahayana is. This has a lot to do with it, which is this kind of, we would call it, you know, maybe altruism, egalitarianism, all of these things. But I wanna take a minute, you know, the the great Vietnamese teacher, master, Thich Nhat Hanh, of course, just recently passed away. And, you know, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to, you know, summarize somebody like that uh, and say anything about it, really. It's, you know, I'm even having trouble even now, just, but I want to mention something that Thich Nhat Hanh taught me through his writings, through his books. And it's something that that line, it, it's something he said. And so Thich Nhat Hanh has this teaching about upeksha, about equanimity. And I think it's a really important teaching about equanimity. So he even, and what I like about it, and this is in uh, he says it in a number of different books, but I'm thinking of it in the, the heart of the Buddha's teaching. Great book. Um, and in the section on Upeksha, on equanimity, he addresses that there's sort of a misunderstanding or what he perceives, I too perceive, as a misunderstanding about equanimity. And he says, there's this idea, now I'm just paraphrasing, a, don't have the book with me, so I'm paraphrasing, but he basically says that this idea that, that it's sort of about indifference in a sense of like this idea that I could give you one thing, say to eat in one hand and a different thing in another hand and one you would normally find putrid and another you would find like delicious and whatever. And the idea that equanimity is about viewing them as equal he dresses that's not really, at least for him, it as, as, as a way of thinking of what the Buddha was even talking about. And what he, the example that he gives is he says it's like a parent who has a lot of children. And although society might deem one of the children more beautiful than the other, 
or one of the children more intelligent than the other, or one of the children whatever than the other, the equanimous parent loves all the children equally, but not as if they're the same, actually appreciating and valuing the uniqueness of each one for their uniqueness without elevating one's uniqueness over another's uniqueness. That the real love, the real equanimity is a love that extends equally to all. And that's not at all, you know, bland and kind of muted, muted emotion. That's a lot, that's a lot of love. Like, do you have that much love actually to extend equally, not just to all, all children, but the sentiment of this last line is the idea of, do you have that amount of love to extend towards all beings in that way? So I read that last line of regarding one another as parents in that same kind of vein of equanimity that as Thich Nhat Hanh teaches. So, okay. So I did want to say that about that last line because it's so beautiful and powerful. Everybody feeling okay? Your, your silence is agreement. So, <laughs> so now everybody's wonderful, right? They are regarding everybody with complete love and equanimity and that it was like this. When the Buddha, the great lion among humans, arrived in the city with the 10 great powers, all beings immediately attained pure and immense happiness. The eyes of the blind were able to see. The ability to hear arose in the deaf. The insane regained their minds and the inattentive became concentrated. The naked received clothes and the hungry received food. Anyone who was poor received wealth, much to their delight. Billions of gods hovered in the sky and venerated the Buddha's strength. In order to venerate the Leoline preacher, they showered down a rain of flowers. The sound of drums, terracotta drums, cymbals and conches, unfathomable sources of joy resounded in, in the city as the Buddha entered, all being due to the Buddha's merit. When the entire city shook, everyone was filled with joy. When people beheld these amazing sights, they achieved a vast state of joy. They were untroubled by attachment and devoid of anger, stupidity, and stinginess. Pride and other evils and all such troubles ceased at that moment. All the people were filled with joy and inspired and regarded one another as parents. When the Buddha with the 10 great strengths entered the city for the happiness of all beings, the instruments of non-human beings resounded though no one had struck them. The world with its gods, humans, and asuras was bathed in the light of the well-gone one. It was when the Buddha in this way entered the city to benefit beings that such a great variety of wondrous miracles occurred. All right. So... That was the grand introduction to this, uh, to this beautiful sutra. And I say introduction because very much like um, a narrative, we, that's a hard break. We've been introduced to the event, the Buddha has arrived. And now for the story and the first sort of lesson or the first teaching of the sutra. So when the Bhagavan, when the Blessed One, entered the city of Rajgriha, a influential merchant by the name of destroyer of vice or destroyer of the non-virtuous, who was a householder bodhisattva, was present in the city. From afar, from, from an alleyway, the Chinese version says, he saw the Tathagata approaching. 
the Tathagata, or the, sorry, the Bhagavan, the Blessed One, was beautiful and joyful, with peaceful faculties and a peaceful mind. He was thoroughly gentle and tranquil, having reached the perfection of gentleness and tranquility, restrained and collected like an elephant, and like a lake, clear, limpid, and lucid. His body was adorned with the 32 marks of a great being and the 80 excellent minor marks, and his whole appearance was exquisite, excellent, and perfect. Seeing the world honored one, the blessed one, the Bhagavan, the Bodhisattva, destroyer of vice, was overcome with faith. Moved by this faith or certainty, Shraddha, he went before the blessed one bowed his head at the feet of the Blessed One, circumambulated him three times, and stood to one side. He then joined his palms, bowed to the Blessed One, and asked, World Honored One, what qualities do Bodhisattva, those great beings, require to swiftly and fully awaken Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, unsurpassed perfect enlightenment, to purify their Buddha realms and to acquire the arrays of virtues of the Buddha realms, just as they desire. All right, so that's the question. So that's the first question. So interestingly, we are introduced to destroyer of vice or destroyer of the non-virtuous a householder bodhisattva. The fact that this bodhisattva is a householder bodhisattva will be very relevant to the teaching that's about to come. But of course, if you've read like a famous sutra, like the Vimalakirti Sutra, Vimalakirti, also a famous householder bodhisattva. So within the Mahayana tradition, we are accustomed to seeing householder bodhisattvas. There is a tradition of forest dwelling bodhisattvas as well, but it's important to note and understand that within the Mahayana tradition, the bodhisattva path can be and is practiced both in a mode of householding and in a mode of, quote, renunciation, by which I mean forest dwelling. And this, actually, what we're about to talk about gets into that. The question that our bodhisattva has is this question regarding purifying Buddha lands. This uh, Tibetan translation that I'm reading, it uses the language of Buddha realms. I think the Chinese is probably Buddha lands. Um, Buddha land. So that's, the idea of this, I, uh, this question, how does one, how does a bodhisattva purify their Buddha land? So how do they, how do those bodhisattvas, those great beings, right? What, what quality actually is the specific question? What quality do they have that allows them to Hold on to that question. That's a great question. It's the answer to that is coming. So the question is about the what quality the bodhisattvas have that allow them to generate bodhicitta, in particular anuttara samyak sam bodhicitta, and then purify their Buddha land and acquire the arrays of virtues of Buddha lands. So that's sort of like three different ideas that are all part of the Bodhisattva path. I've already actually talked at length about the idea of generating bodhicitta or generating the mind of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. That was in part either one or two, I forget. So we dealt with that. Tonight we're talking about this idea of purifying the Buddha land and then sort of as a culmination of that project or as a culmination of that, there's this language of adorning the Buddha land with virtues or a, what it says in this Tibetan translation, acquiring the arrays of virtues. <clears throat> Those are all sort of 
or both the same idea for, well, it's this idea that part of the process of purifying a Buddha land is adorning it. And by adorning, my research of all these different sutras that talk about adornments, they are talking about beautifying, be beautifying with adornments. But if you've read the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, you know these adornments are not adornments. They are called adornments. And the idea of that part of the Vajra Sutra is that although we're using this language of adornment, and we do mean beautification, there's this idea of beautifying with virtue. And it's a beautiful aspect of the Bodhisattva path. It's a beautiful aspect of this idea of purifying a Buddha land. And one example that I give a lot, I think it's a, an accessible example, but you can extrapolate it to many other things. But while we tend to think about adornments and beauty, typically maybe on the visual and the auditory, we think of music, we think of uh, maybe, I don't know, uh, Pink Floyd light show, right? <laughs> or something, right? But the idea is we think of visual adornments, beautiful things, beautiful sounds, maybe beautiful smells, beautiful food, all of those. So, right, things of the five senses, right? Things within the kamadhatu, things within the realm of desire. Well, the bodhisattva sort of having transcended the realm of desire and the realm of form and the formless realm, frankly, but sort of having, being in a transcendent mode opens the bodhisattva up to these other kinds of adornments. And one example is something like telling the truth. From the bodhisattva point of view, deception or telling lies is ugly. <laughs> it's, it's like aesthetically <laughs> ugly. And telling the truth and being honest is beautiful. And so the Bodhisattva adorns their Buddha land with truth, <laughs> nonviolence, and things of that nature. And these become, within the eyes of the Bodhisattva, they become adornments. And that's a very kind of interesting, beautiful way of thinking about the Bodhisattva path in that sense. So that's our bodhisattva's question. What are the qualities that a bodhisattva possesses that allows them to generate anuttara samyak sambodhi, purify a Buddha land, and adorn it with or and adorn it with virtues? Right. So then, out of loving kindness, out of metta for the bodhisattva destroyer of vice or destroyer of the non-virtuous. And in order to train this large assembly of beings, the Blessed One took a seat in one part of the city. Seeing the Blessed One there, hundreds of thousands of beings arrived. In the sky above, trillions of gods joined their palms in respect and honor, bowed toward the Blessed One, and arranged themselves there. The Blessed One then responded to the Bodhisattva destroyer of non-virtue. Noble son, if Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, those great beings, have one quality, they will swiftly and fully awaken to Anuttara Samyak Sambhuti, purify their Buddha lands, and acquire the arrays of virtues of their Buddha lands just as they desire. What is that one quality? Noble son. It is for those bodhisattva great bodhisattvas, those great beings, to develop. It, it is for the bodhisattva great bodhisattvas to develop the mind of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi and to attain perfect awakening out of compassion and pure motivation toward all beings. In this context, 
what is the pure motivation that is to be mastered? Pure motivation is arousing the mind set on awakening and avoiding all non-virtuous acts. What is to be avoided, you may ask? Well, it is greed, anger, and delusion, or attachment, aggression, and ignorance, and craving for the features of the household life. Renouncing these things, bodhisattvas have no desire for gain, honor, or praise, and they abide in the accomplishment of going forth. What is the accomplishment of going forth, you may ask? It is realizing all phenomena just as they are. What is realizing all phenomena just as they are, you may ask? All phenomena refers to the five aggregates, the elements and sense sources, as well as conditioned and unconditioned phenomena. Right. I'm going to pause there. I want to break things down before we get deeper into the answer. So our Bodhisattva asks the question, which is in three parts, but in particular, it's actually only one question. What's the quality that a Bodhisattva has that allows them to do the attainment of Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, purifying their Buddha land, adorning it with virtues? And the Buddha says, well, there's just one quality, right? It is for a Bodhisattva, a great being, to develop the mind set on unsurpassed perfect awakening out of compassion and pure motivation toward all beings. So that is a very important articulation of the vow, which is uh, I think what we talked about in part two of the Bodhisattva path, which is the vow of the Bodhisattva. And so that idea of the vow of the bodhisattva concerns this, this attaining, if you will, of a supreme, unsurpassable, awakened mind, anuttara samyak sambodhi. But the vow is to attain that anuttara samyak sambodhi for the sake of all beings. And that is sort of that's a sort of a thing unto itself. And so it's sort of this altruistic pursuit of enlightenment. And that is a, a kind of a complex formula that the sutra is sort of meant to disentangle in that way. And so we're going to go through it. All right, there's a lot of questions coming in the chat. I'm going to try to uh, address them or get them at the side of my eye. Thank you for writing. Um, so let's, let's see. So let's just, let's deal with the, the first question is regarding, um, is this directed towards monastics is directed towards non-monastics? Well, our Bodhisattva here is a householding Bodhisattva. So the teachings right here directed towards a householder, but the idea is, is that this is a, a conversation about going forth, which is the Buddhist language for renunciation, for going off and being a monk in that sense, monk or a nun. So we're kind of interested in what dis maybe distinguishes those two. And this being a Mahayana Sutra, we're going to have a Mahayana answer for what constitutes going forth. In fact, we already heard it, but we're going to dive deeper into that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the second and third questions are a little long, and I think by the end of to this section, we might get to those, but if not, I will try to get back to it. So there's one quality, and it's this dedication or this vowing to attain this enlightened state, but for the sake of all beings. And it's out of compassion and pure motivation 
toward all beings. And so if you're like me and you're an inquisitive person and you know, oh, this is all hinging on, on kind of doing this the right way. And there's, you know, there's dangers of, of, you know, spiritual materialism and there's dangers of ego and spiritual ego and all of these things in here. And so what's the pure motivation by which the Bodhisattva navigates this vow? Because it sounds self-interested to try to attain a state of exalted supreme enlightenment. And then you're doing it for all beings. There's a, a lot going on here. And so in classic sutra fashion, if you had that question too, about, well, what is pure motivation? The Buddha responds, well, in this context, well, actually our Bodhisattva asks on our behalf, Buddha, Buddha, it, in this context, what is the pure motivation that is to be mastered by the Bodhisattva? Ah, pure motivation is arousing the mind set on awakening and avoiding all non-virtues. Oh, okay. I got you. So mindset on awakening and mindset on avoiding non-virtues. What's to be avoided? Okay. That's the second. And now we understand that what is to be avoided are, of course, the three poisons. This is Buddhism. This is the Dharma. So we, that's it. So Greed, anger, delusion, uh, attraction, aversion, and confusion. This uh, version translates it as attachment, aggression, and ignorance. And then there's this additional one. And craving for the features of the household life. Renouncing these things, bodhisattvas have no desire for gain, honor, or praise, and they abide in the accomplishment of going forth. So that's actually kind of a very kind of radical statement in a way. It's a very Mahayana thing to say, but basically, if I read that, the way that I read that is, and I've, 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 I've mentioned this sort of uh, many Dharma doors, I'm not going to talk about all of the various features of a household life because it's actually not about whether it's this feature of a household life or that feature, because what's really at stake, if, if you're, you know, if you've studied the Dharma, the sentence is about craving for the features of the household life. So my point is, and the example that I'm going to give in a second, is that the important thing here is about the craving for the features of the household life. And the idea is, is that renouncing these things, bodhisattvas have no desire for gain, honor, or praise, and they abide in the accomplishment of going forth. So there it is, the, the language again, going forth is Buddhist language. The Chinese call it uh, chujia, to leave home, to go forth. That's usually traditionally means to go become a, a, again, become a monastic, become a monk or a nun. But this is saying that to relinquish or let go of the craving for the features of the household life, that is the accomplishment of going forth. An example that I often give is this one. So this is my water bottle, right? I, my hard-earned money, I went down to the place, I picked it out, I bought it. It's my water bottle. Watch. Ah. All right, now watch. I relinquish it. It's not mine. I don't own it. Come and get it. I, I, I abandon relinquish ownership. Cheers. The point is, is there's two different ways to be in a relationship with all of this. There's the one that I was just talking about, which was the relationship of ownership, which is definitely an expression of craving 
if not an, an expression of clinging, of course, but an expression of craving. And if you understand dependent origination, there's a deep relationship between craving and clinging in that sense. But my point is, is that this sutra is sort of cutting right to the root cause of the problem. And from the Mahayana point of view, these, the creature comforts, as we call them, these, the things that are couch and are this and are that, the stuff isn't the problem. It's how we relate to the stuff. In the earlier, the Hinayana path, the more hardcore, ascetic, kind of monastic path, the idea was is that the stuff was kind of the problem, and therefore you relinquished the stuff, meaning you literally moved away from it. You literally, and in the early days of Buddhism, you know, you, you stripped naked. You went off, shaved your head, and basically in a kind of, I mean, you could get very Freudian about it, but you are reborn. You're totally naked. You even have a shaved head, just like the day you were born, bald as, you know. And the idea is you're now on your new life, your new path when you've renounced that way. But in that tradition, at least from the Mahayana point of view, it seems like they're treating the stuff as the problem and not the mind that clings to the stuff. Because the idea is, is that if you're in a cave meditating, but you're, you're, you're flipping through an Ikea catalog in your mind, dreaming of like, oh, when, when this retreat is over, I can't wait to, to get a new whatever and a whatever, whatever. It doesn't matter that you're in a cave meditating. If you are attached to and craving and desiring, what is the line? The features of the household life. So the Buddha's direct answer to the Bodhisattva here, and you know, again, it's very kind of radical to say that renouncing these things, Bodhisattvas have no desire for gain, honor, or praise, and they abide in the accomplishment of going forth. And, and then just in case we weren't clear, right, rhetorically, the Buddha, at, and what is the accomplishment of going forth, you may ask? What is the completion, the fulfillment of the leaving the household life? It is realizing all phenomena just as they are. So that's a kind of a beautiful Buddhist sentiment, certainly a Mahayana one in that sense, where there's a really heavy emphasis on what is called tathata, suchness, uh, thusness, as it isness, things as they are in that way. And so we get this kind of interesting idea that the accomplishment of going forth is realizing all dharmas. This translation has it as all phenomena, which is, that's fine. That's a pretty standard translation, but you should know it's, it is realizing all dharmas just as they are, all things, all phenomena. Well, Buddha, what is realizing all dharmas just as they are? Well, all phenomena, all dharmas here refers to the five aggregates, the elements, and sense sources, as well as conditioned and unconditioned phenomena. So for the dharma heads out there, you of course know all, all of those, but Five aggregates, of course, which we're going to break down in a second, but those are, of course, classic Buddhist teaching regarding what makes up the sentient subject. If there's no Atman, if there's no soul or essence or even individuality or a personality, no Pudgala, if there's no self here, then what's going on? Well, the classic Buddhist understanding of the sentient being, the sentient subject, is it's an, a, a momentary coalescence of five aggregates, flesh or form that aggregates into very sensitive humps of flesh that we call sensory organs that are in the business of sensing. So form, sensations, 
perceptions of the sensory organs, sensory differentiation of the ears, sensory differentiation of the eyes. So form, sensation, perception, conditioning, all of those hunks of flesh, the eyes, the ears, the nose, the brain, all of the hunks of flesh that are in the business of sensing and thereby perceiving, those hunks of flesh get conditioned <laughs> into certain formations that make them function a certain way or perceive a certain way or think a certain way, which leads us to consciousness, <laughs> the fifth skandha. So that's what's going on here is this, this dance of the five aggregates, sensate, sensating, perceiving, having been conditioned and further conditioning and therefore being conscious. So those are the five aggregates. The next on the list are the elements. You could read the elements as the four elements. I don't think it actually refers to the four elements. I won't even bother checking the Chinese, but normally what, what would follow this is that it's about the sensory organs and then the sense sources. So it does mention the sense sources or the sense objects, but usually in that formulation of the five aggregates, six senses, six sense objects, as well as samskrita dharma and asamskrita dharma, as well as conditioned things and unconditioned things. So conditioned things, of course, there's basically anything you could possibly imagine, any idea, any concept, thought, a pencil, a bird, whatever, all conditioned phenomena, as well as unconditioned phenomena. Things like space, and the unconditioned, unformed realm of space, nirvana, these things are considered unconditioned. So that was our list of things. And that is the list of all phenomena, conditioned things, unconditioned things, the sensory agent, sensory organs, sensory objects. That's everything. Okay, and that's what we're, we are to realize, by the way, just as it is. <laughs> so let's start with the aggregates. How are the five aggregates understood? They are understood to be illusory, void, empty, unobservable, unborn, and unceasing. They are understood in this way to the degree that one does not see them as being real. When there is no seeing, no knowing, no assuming, no thinking, and no conceptualizing them to be real, all concepts are pacified. And this is what is called understanding the aggregates. Understanding the aggregates is understanding all phenomena. This is the accomplishment of going forth. Okay, so let's, let's break that down. Excellent. Hope everybody's doing okay. So now we get to the real meat of the matter in that sense, which is, so the Buddhist says, again, it's this interesting line of um, thinking where, well, what does that mean? Well, it means this. Well, what does that mean? It means this. What does that mean? It means this. So we get to this point about we're really focused on realizing all dharmas or realizing all phenomena just as they are. Phenomena such as the five aggregates, phenomena such as all of this. For example, let's start with the five aggregates. How are they to be understood? Well, they're to, under, they are to be understood as illusory, void, empty, unobservable, unborn, and unceasing. And then to see them that way, 
that is this purification of all concepts. And that's the true accomplishment of going forth. So if you, obviously, if you come to Dharma Doors, if you've been listening to me at all, you already know that all dharmas and all, and all phenomena are illusory, void, empty, unobservable, and all of, unborn and uncreated. But let me remind you about that idea. So this idea of emptiness, again, it's kind of this foundational concept. And, you know, if I, I want to do that thing where I say the thing very clearly, very bluntly now, and then back up and try to really kind of explain it. But the really clear thing is, it's basically saying, if houses and homes and the aggregates and all everything are empty where are you leave who's who's leaving home to go where to understand emptiness is the accomplishment of going forth that's the great relinquishment truly because in the understanding of emptiness, you're waving bye-bye to that objective world that you could cling on to. And that's the great relinquishment. That's the great going forth. All right, there. I've said it very bluntly, very clearly, the relationship between emptiness and this teaching. Now let's back up and kind of dive into that. So I was going to mention... Um, I'm going to start with this one. So the list of it is uh, regarding the aggregates. It says that they are to be understood as illusory, void, empty, unobservable. Uh, let's start with unobservable. And I actually, I, just for logic's sake, I'll probably back up to illusory. But I did want to mention a funny thing, I was reading this other suture the other day, and it has to do with the idea of unobservable. And actually it was the Vimalakirti Sutra. So if you're familiar with Vimalakirti, this is a teaching of Vimalakirti. He says to one of the Shravakas, to one of the disciples in chapter three, he says that, that basically it's this thing of, um, well, he goes through all the senses and it's about hearing all sounds as if they are echoes, for example, with no point of origin, just reflections of sound, right? And then he says, regarding visible forms, he says to the monk, you should regard all visible forms like a blind person does. Now, that's a kind of a, you know, it's a, it's a profound idea, and we're going to get into what Vimalakirti means by that and what the sutra is talking about. But that idea, I thought it was funny in getting ready for tonight's class because of this idea of when, we, when the Buddha entered the city, right, the, the blind learn, you know, regain their sight. But you could also flip it and say when the Buddha enters the city, right, the seeing become blind. It's kind of a funny play. So let's talk about how all phenomena are illusory, void, empty, unobservable, unborn, and unceasing. So, you know, there, you know, take your pick. We could, we could go with, uh, we could go with clocks tonight. Sometimes I talk about the emptiness of the clock. Sometimes I talk about the emptiness of cups. Sometimes I talk about the emptiness of fists, right? So an, an, one that I've been using a lot, I'll use it tonight. I like it. I think it's funny. But it's this idea about these things <laughs> that we see and what they are in that sense. And so this is one that I've used as an example. And the idea is, is that if you're looking at the screen and you know what I'm holding up, <laughs> like you could give a name to it and you could give a function a use value. If you could give a, a location in your home, maybe where you might find this, right? 
if you're seeing what I think you're seeing, let's talk about that because that is what we are talking about as being illusory, void, empty, unobservable, unborn, and unceasing. So what, and I don't, I don't have all night to do the emptiness talk. In fact, I just realized that I, I really don't have all night. So just want to remind you that the idea, what you can think of as a thought experiment is an alien, some other creature from some other planet that doesn't eat, that doesn't <laughs> defecate, that just has a whole other kind of anatomy, just doesn't even function like ours at all. And they, boop, they show up and I go and I show them this. Do you think that that alien would see what, what you see? Probably not. And so that thing, the thing that you see, you, by which I'm, I mean the roll of toilet paper, that thing, we need to take a step back now and think about that alien that wouldn't see what we see and then realize, oh, so the roll of toilet paper is an, is an idea in my head. And that is kind of like a projection onto something. Because when you see this, you're like, I could use that. I know what I'd do with that. I know where, I, where I'd use that. So there's this way in which that thing, that thing, it doesn't exist out here. Okay, you, you might be like, you know, you're, you're right, but there's something out there though. You're holding something in your hand. And that's where I would say, am I? Hold on, because the idea is, is that if we understand that the role of toilet paper is this concept, this idea, what they call a dharma. If we understand that that roll of toilet paper is a concept or an idea that's in your mind in that way, and the other alien wouldn't see it, then what is out here in Buddhist language, they would call, this is just the form, the function, the use, the name, all of that. That's the kamadatu, that's the realm of desire, that's only conditioning over there. The realm of form though, if we're in the realm of form, then I don't have one thing in my hand because there's the, the cardboard, the cardboard thing, and then this, that's two different things. And they only, they're only one thing when there's that roll of toilet paper, but we know that there, that's not out here. So all of a sudden, the singularity of this, the singularity of this is, is dissolving. And we realize that the concept, the role of toilet paper is, is, again, it's only over there in your conditioned mind. And so therefore, that, meaning the role of toilet paper, right, that's empty because it's just a concept. It has no tangible existence at all. It certainly doesn't have a tangible existence for our alien friend. And so it is truly like a mirage, like an illusion in that way where you're seeing it, but as the Buddha describes, it's like, it's like we have a, a, a cataract on our eye and we're seeing these things and we think they're out there, but they're really a product of the cataract. Well, the cataract is a conditioning of the mind that's generating this idea. And if I, if I wanted to really show this to you, the idea would be, oh, look, it's, it's like, oh, it's all white and it's clean. But what happened if I, if I did this and it was brown now? you'd probably go, ew, it's defiled. It's impure. You know, it, is it? Or do you have a problem with color? You have a problem with colors and you favor certain colors over other colors. You should look into that really. But the idea is 
is that all of that, the ideas of purity and impurity, all have to do with what you think this is, which all have to do with that concept. So that, the concept, and actually the sutra in a second is going to talk about conceptualizing. That's a roll of toilet paper, a concept in that way. And so by understanding that as an illusion, it, I know it appears as it does, but the idea is that deeper, it's like an illusion, and therefore void, shunyata, empty, unobservable. And that's, what I, that's why I brought in the alien friend. Our alien friend can't, can't see that roll of toilet paper. It's unobservable, actually. It's only in your mind head in that sense. So unobservable, unborn, and unceasing. That's the real important part. So if we understand that there's not a roll of toilet paper out here, it's only over there. If we understand that, then the roll of toilet paper was not manufactured in a plant. It didn't come out, pack. It's, it was never created. It's just an idea in your head that arises upon the conditioning. So it doesn't actually get made, doesn't actually come into existence, and it actually doesn't go out of existence because it never came into existence. So all of that, that way of seeing, they, all phenomena, all dharmas, not just rolls of toilet paper, birds and flowers and everything, all dharmas, they are understood in this way to the degree that one does not see dharmas as being real. When there is no seeing, no knowing, no assuming, no thinking, and no conceptualizing all of those dharmas to be real, if there's no conceptualizing them to be real, all concepts are purified. And this is what is called understanding the aggregates. Understanding the aggregates is understanding all phenomena. This is the accomplishment of going forth. And that should have tremendous echoes of the Heart Sutra, by the way, about it's all about the emptiness of the skandhas, but be, that is true of all dharmas. Everybody with me? I know there's been a good heavy duty session. One more important lesson. It brings us back to kind of the top. So the next paragraph, bodhisattva, mahasattva, those great beings who have entered this practice will not abandon beings. Why not? To the degree that one understands all dharmas, all phenomena, one can teach all beings and yet not apprehend beings or phenomena. If bodhisattva, mahasattvas possess this one quality, they will swiftly and fully awaken to unsurpassed and perfect Buddhahood, purify their Buddha land, and acquire the array of virtues of their Buddha land, just as they desire. All right, I have a few minutes. So that sort of concludes the Buddha's first lesson to our Bodhisattva destroyer virtue. Again, it's a really interesting one about what it means to leave home within the Mahayana Buddhist tradition. And that's basically this idea again of seeing all phenomena as empty. Emptiness ain't any more empty in Kathmandu than it is in San Francisco. That's the reality of emptiness. And so leaving home in the Mahayana is more about emptiness than it is about shaving your head and going off into the woods in that way. Even though that might be very conducive to attaining Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, it will depend. And that's the teaching of the Mahayana is that it depends. Okay. Um, 
one last thing, and I apologies for not being able to get to all the questions. I can tell that they're really, really great questions. Yeah, they're really great questions. I encourage everybody to think about those questions, but I really can't, can't they're detailed, deep questions. Um, I do just wanna kind of wrap this up. One more thing to say. Um, yeah, the most important thing that happens at the end that goes back to the beginning of my Dharma talk, I mentioned this twofold aspect of the Bodhisattva vow, that the vow is to attain this supremely awakened state of a Buddha and doing it for, on the behalf of or for the benefit of all sentient beings. So it does then occur to the Bodhisattva, <laughs> but all sentient beings are empty. So yeah, this is important. So bodhisattva, mahasattvas who have entered this practice will not abandon beings. And why not? To the degree that one understands dharmas, one can teach all beings and yet not apprehend beings or phenomena. So that's sort of this, you know, I often say it's sort of the paradox of the Bodhisattva path that the Bodhisattva vows to save all sentient beings, but a defining characteristic of a Bodhisattva is that they know that there are no such things as sentient beings. And that paradox, although it may seem paradoxical, it's in no way paradoxical, of course because the whole teaching of the Buddha is about no self. From the beginning, he has been trying to tell a bunch of no self having <laughs> entities about no self. So the paradox of all of this is, it's been there from the beginning. It's just sort of about the difference between a form of practice that is socially engaged as the great teacher Thich Nhat Hanh said, a form of practice that's more socially engaged, which is like this, versus a kind of a more renunciatory in, in that sense of asceticism. So I really wanted to emphasize that point, that that, and that'll get played out more as we go along. But, and so, when the Blessed One taught this Dharma door, of accomplishing the arrays of virtues of the Buddha lands, the Bodhisattva, destroyer of non-virtue, gained the patient, tolerant acceptance of the birthlessness of all phenomena. Filled with joy and happiness, he rose into the sky, the height of seven palm trees. Moreover, 2,000 beings in the assembly developed the mind set on Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi, and 14,000 gods and humans purified their Dharma eye, which sees phenomena free from dust and stain. Right. So, we've seen this in many a Dharma doors, in many a uh, Mahayana Sutra that when, when a bodhisattva achieves this particular kashanti, so a kashanti, kashanti is the practice of patience or tolerance, peacefulness, and there's a specific kind of kashanti that is the patient tolerance for the birthlessness or non-arising of all phenomena. So we just talked about how all phenomena don't arise or cease. They're all empty. They're illusory. They're constructed conditional concepts. We just talked about all that. To understand that, like even kind of logically, even like just language wise, like what did I just say tonight? Just to sort of understand the emptiness of all phenomena. That's one thing. To then actually have a kind of 
you know, oceanic Samadhi-esque experience of the emptiness of all phenomena. That's something else. <laughs> so just understanding it is one thing, having a kind of a visceral experience of it is another thing. And then arriving at the state of a peaceful, tranquil tolerance for that birthlessness of all phenomena. That's this accomplishment that the Bodhisattva achieves. And we've seen this. And when a Bodhisattva achieves this, he rises or she, which we have seen many times, rises to the height of seven palm trees. <laughs> so that's a kind of a trope in Mahayana Buddhism. You know, we say that I was like on cloud nine or seventh heaven. Those expressions come from experiences people have had, but then they become just kind of stock phrases. So similarly, this probably arose from a transcendent ecstatic experience, but it becomes a kind of a trope stock phrase. All right. Um, and then just to kind of segue us in, actually, let me make sure I've said everything that I want to say about this section. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas? I know there's the, the many questions. Let's see if I can... Yeah, so a lot of the questions that are asked, really great questions, by the way, and they're actually, everybody knows they're the exact kinds of questions that I like to answer, because they're historical questions, or some of them about different schools of Buddhism. And I would like to talk more about that. Don't have time tonight. Um, really just trying to focus on giving this sutra its due. So I apologize to the person who was asking those detailed questions. Um, anybody have any thing maybe that was inspired directly from the sutra? Feeling okay? Cool. Then just to prime us for next time, these you know these sutras they just keep they just keep going in that way, and it's always every Sunday when I get ready for these classes, it's always like all right I'll stop there probably. Oh no, but then I'll have to read the next paragraph. Well, then I'll definitely have to read the next paragraph. If I, I will. So it gets really hard to choose a stopping point because what happens is, is that our bodhisattva achieves this um, patient tolerance for the birthlessness of all phenomena, rises to the height of the seven palm trees, and then the Buddha smiled. It is the nature of things that when a blessed Buddha smiles, variegated light streams pour forth from his mouth in blue, yellow, red, white, violet, crystalline, and silver colors. It then pervades and illuminates countless, limitless worlds before returning. The light then circles the Blessed One three times and then disappears into the crown of his head. And at that point, our, the Venerable Ananda rises from his seat, drapes his shawl over one shoulder, kneels on his right knee, and with his palms held together, asks the Buddha, a long question that we'll get to next week, but why does the Buddha smile? So that's going to be next week's topic. Why is the Buddha smiling? I think that's a great, great theme for next, uh, next Sunday. So stay tuned for that. Jenny, I'm going to pass it over to you in case there's any pressing issues. Thank you again, everybody, for being here.